sound speeds. And this is a bit of a different format than you're used to because this is a live stream. And I'm gonna be answering questions here in a moment, but first I'm gonna to get to some content that I could have easily done in a bunch of separate videos, but I decided instead to do it as one big long one as an end of the year type of recap thing, whatever you wanna call it. And I'm also gonna be covering in this a whole bunch of topics that I would have wanted to otherwise. So call this whatever you want to, call this a recap, call this changes, whatever. Let's get straight into the content here. Sorry it's been a while for anybody that was looking forward to my live streams. My computer completely, for whatever reason, forgot how to do live stream settings. I don't know why. It's just I went to do a live stream one day, and for some strange reason, all my settings were totally different. My screen was 4x3 as opposed to 16x9. There was nothing I could do to fix that. So I reinstalled OBS, I went through everything, and basically just hit a complete reset on everything, and for some strange reason, I was able to configure things once again. The new OBS, I'm not 100% sure I like it because as I started this live stream, it was about half a second off. So we had to actually, if you caught a little bit of the actual live stream, we had to fix this before we went live. So I'm going to try to do live streams more often if I can, especially if I end up having a later and later turnaround. Like for example, on Mondays in the film industry, we usually start work at about 7 a.m. By the end of the week, it could be later. It could be 5, 6, 7 p.m., and in the winter months, it will most likely be about five because we're going to try to maximize our darkness hours for our dark scenes. And we don't have to start nearly as late, which is going to be great because who wants to spend all day Saturday trying to catch up on sleep for whatever crazy reason? All right. So let's talk, first of all, about changes in, I guess you could say, COVID protocols that, that we run into on set were never a thing of the past. As a matter of fact, the film industry has never really acknowledged sleep as being important, but now they do, which is a big thing for us. They never in the past acknowledged sleep as important for health, but because of COVID, they said, we acknowledge that sleep is important and it's important also for you to have downtime, which is nice. So they're no longer killing us with 13, 14 hour days and then uh, and then wondering why we're so tired at the end of the week. Instead, what they're doing is they're trying to schedule about a 10 or 11 hour day. And in many cases, the crew is pretty energetic and pretty fast. And because of other things, like, for example, the CDC originally put out guidelines and every single I've taken three different classes on COVID-19 for the film industry. I took one for uh uh, for Warner Media because I'm on Warner Brothers show. I took one for uh, Georgia Film, and then I took one for uh, Contract Services, which which handles all the courses that you have to take for basically IATSE as a whole, and they manage all that kind of stuff if you go from one one uh, union to another. Now, Contract Services is is one that most people will take the same course nationwide. And the different unions and different states and the different shows can pick and choose whatever they want to, but there are certain guidelines that they all agree on, and those come from the CDC. Now, the CDC specified certain things like you should not be within six feet of someone for 15 minutes. But when we did a trial day on the Warner Brothers show I'm on, I said, okay, so what can you tell me the duration of that is? Is that per day? Is that per week? Is that per month? Is that for the entire length of the show? Is that per episode? Is it per setup, per scene? And they kept saying, oh, no, it's within six feet for 15 minutes. I'm like, yes, for what duration? You have to clarify that because otherwise, if you tell me every 15 minutes, oh, okay, I can easily, you know, not exceed 15 minutes every 15 minutes, you know, being within six feet of someone. If you tell me in a day and you're scheduling a 10-hour day, I can maybe work within that. If we go 14, 15 hours, could be a problem. So that's why I was asking for clarification. And there's a lot of things like that that have not been clarified until recently. That, for example, was something that was about two or three weeks into the show. They finally said, oh, by the way, we have a clarification. It's per day now. I'm like, great. You know, now we at least know because before it's, it's it, the analogy I used to him is I said, I could be the most brilliant stockbroker in the entire world. If I said Microsoft is going to go down. Okay, when? It's going to go down. The stock price is going to crash. Okay, when? It's going to crash. That's enough. No, it's not. I need to know when. Time matters. And so that's what I was telling them. I said, 
it's great to know I shouldn't be within six feet of someone for 15 or more minutes, but in what time frame? And finally, they, de- they defined that in the CDC, and that's when the film industry started to kind of pick up on that and specify that as well. Uh, now, some shows went above and beyond and went ahead and defined that for themselves, as I understand it. I don't know uh, that any of the big guns wanted to misstay, missay anything, so they didn't uh, outright uh, specify anything. They waited for the CDC guidelines. Now, some some are uh, some state studios are getting advice and advisement from uh, from doctors directly at renowned ho- uh, hospitals. I'm not going to go straight into Warner Brothers because some of some of this stuff, you know, is just you know you don't need to know it. But what I will tell you is that. They're getting under uh, they're getting advisement. Different studios are getting advisement from different doctors of authority and not just the media, which is great. Uh, The CDC is also defining certain things as a broad spectrum. Now, some companies like Warner Brothers, the company that I'm, I'm currently working under, they're a little bit more conservative in many ways regarding things. They're a little bit more like that doesn't really work for us. We're going to take it one step beyond because they're trying to take this the the pandemic very seriously. Now, other shows, I was on one show a week before I started this one, and they were a little bit more lax regarding the protocol, which is probably what a lot of people have run into on shows when they're like, oh, it's so much better at this other studio. Warner Brothers is taking things more seriously. And it's because they want to, first of all, they're a lot bigger than a lot of the smaller guns, uh, a lot of the smaller shows that I've been, that I've heard about. But the bigger shows also, they, they want to take care of people. They have long runs. They want the, the crew to be safe. They want... Uh, you know, there's also liability as a company. There's there's a whole bunch of factors to it. And so they're being a little bit more conservative regarding everything. Now, uh, let me real quickly mention one of the bigger things that has happened because of COVID. And, and, and before, we did not really run into it. In the film industry, we have never really cared a whole lot about sickness on set. If someone gets sick, go on to work. That's usually been the way it is. You just go to work and if you have to cough, you just, (coughs) you know, do whatever and you cough and you go about your daily life. But that doesn't fly under COVID. Under COVID, here's a good example for you. I had my bottle of water with me on set, took a sip of it. It went down the wrong pipe and instantly like, (coughs) you know, like this. And instantly people around me start scattering, you know, freaking out. Oh my gosh. You know, it's like. Not quite that bad, but you understand where I'm going with this. This is kind of silly and ridiculous at the same time. It's like, let's freak out because someone is obviously choking on water, but who knows? It could be COVID. That's the joke that we have, at least on set. You know, someone, someone sneezes or someone's like, uh, up, oh, got some COVID over here. You know, that kind of thing. You know, of course, people are going to joke about it, even though as a disease, it is no joke. We even had it in our house for about six and a half, seven weeks, and it is not a fun thing to have to deal with. Um, But what I can tell you is that the fact that studios are acknowledging now that sickness is important to keep in mind regarding employees, because we've all, if anybody that works in the film industry understands that if you get sick, you're going to infect everyone around you, or you could at least, because in this country, prior to 2020, we have never worn masks. In Asian countries, for example, if you got sick and you had a call, a cold or something like that, you just wear a mask, usually with a smiley face or something like that, like the ones you've seen people wearing because of the, the pandemic. And people are more than happy to do that and and keep their washing their hands and keep sanitizing uh, their hands if they can't. And it's been great because they don't spread their illness. But in America, we never had that. Prior to 2020, if you wore a mask into a bank, you'd be tackled and taken to jail. Now, if you wear a mask, when you walk into a bank, you're considered someone who's being responsible. That's what 2020 has done in a nutshell. So hopefully going forward, masks, if you are sick and you feel sickness, I don't know what the state is by the time you watch this, if it could be months after this and we're already into 2021 or 2022, you could be looking at this and know everything. But at the time of this video, which is December 7th, 2020, there is absolutely no vaccine that has been offered to everybody. 
And the ones that they have talked about, they've said, OK, well, we're a little bit concerned here. You hear you hear people talking about how it alters your DNA. People other respond to that and say, oh, no, that's a conspiracy theory. There was an article that somebody, uh, our key grip, just got through talking about and he was reading from some source. He said, you know, uh, he was reading it. He says, oh, look at this thing. It's, it's potentially causing uh, women's bodies to reject the placenta. OK, who knows what's going to ultimately happen here? Is it going to cause sterilization? Who knows? Is it going to, you know, there's a lot of unknown factors to this. What I will tell you is that if you decide you're going to take the vaccine for whatever reason, be aware of a few things. Like, look, for example, at the fact that as of what when I last looked, the manufacturers of the vaccine are holding their hands up in the air. They're not being held liable for anything. You can't sue them if there's a problem with the vaccine. Maybe it's because of Operation Warp Speed. Who knows? What I can tell you, though, is that if you... Get something, you have a weird side effect for whatever reason, you have a health issue after the fact, you are you could be in a situation where you're not able to sue because of it, if that's your thing. I mean, if you suddenly ended up being sterilized and that was an actual le- legit fear, who knows? It could be something that all of a sudden people uh, should have taken seriously. I don't know what the future is going to bring. All I know is that you should definitely understand that there could be risk and look up the risk before you continue, can, uh, consider taking it. In the meantime, when you're talking about uh, when you were talking about sickness on set, the big thing that I will tell you is that you definitely want to keep your hands washed. You definitely want to try to stay away, especially if you're a sound person. If you're a, a sound mixer, it's easy to stay off set and stay away from everybody. Even the utility, you can say, stay, talk to me six feet away and you don't have to go inside of six feet from anybody. A boom operator, on the other hand, is going to be in a bit of a predicament. Because he or she has to stand on set, usually wherever that he or she possibly can fit in there at the very, very end of the lighting setup. And once camera has taken all the space they want to. Here's something I mentioned on the very first day. If we have a set, let's just say it's 15 by 15. Actors are at the other side of the room. And you put three cameras in there and they are all, the camera operators are all spaced appropriately six feet apart. Their dolly grips are facing outwards at at all those different angles because each one, A camera, B camera, and C camera, each have their own pods, which is A camera, the first AC, second AC, and dolly grip are all considered to be part of the same pod. So if one of them contact uh, contracts the virus and tests positive, all of them are going home because they touch the same device over and over again. They, they touch lenses, they touch the camera, they touch the dollies, they touch all that kind of stuff. So they're all considered infected because they're in close proximity to each other. Boom operator does not have a pod like that. Boom operator, sound utility, sound mixture, we're all in different pods. We're not in the same sound department pod, and that's what you would expect us to be in, right? It doesn't work that way. The way it works is because the boom operator is on set, I'm away from everybody, and I'm in charge of my own safety. If something happens to me and I test positive, they will start contact tracing and determining if I have been within six feet of anyone else for 15 or more minutes in a day since my last test. Because if I test on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, which is my current test schedule, if I test on Monday, that's a negative. But Wednesday, it comes back as a positive. They're going to say, who have you been in contact with since that test on Monday? So on Monday, on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, who was I within six feet of? And I got to go through the contact tracing procedure with them and talk about this. And if I had been within six feet of someone for 15 or more minutes, those people are going to go home for 14 days. If I test positive, I go home for 10. Now, there was a thing for a while that they were talking about where if you stayed uh, stayed away for 24 hours, you could take a PCR test. And then uh, 24 hours later, you could take another PCR test. In America and in Canada, I don't believe that's a thing with the, protect, the production company I'm currently working with. However, internationally, that is a possibility. You can, in some countries, test to get out of it and consider that to be a false positive. If you take other PCR tests and it's considered to be, uh, and, and those are, are considered to be uh, uh, negative results. But in America, that's not an option, at least with the production company I'm working for. You are home for 10 days. Now, why is it 10 days for you, but 14 days for everyone else that you have been within six feet at 15 minutes for? The reason why is because if you test positive, then your viral load has shed at some point and it's been picked up by the nasal swab that has been tested in the PCR test. And that has been what's given a positive result, a positive, uh, a positive uh, uh, test result. However, 
anyone you have been considered to be exposed to would have a period of 14 days before the symptoms could potentially show up. So if it shows up after two days or three days or 14 days, cool. You now have the symptoms of COVID and you're going to be home until those have had passed. However, if you do not show symptoms after 14 days, you can come back to work. That's the reason why CDC says 14 days is the magic time period. So that's the reason why if you test positive, you go home for 10, everyone else that you have been within that distance, that distance six feet for 15 more minutes is going to go home for 14 days. Now, this has been an issue on some shows, some shows that, for example, are in busy areas and suddenly you have all the A players and the B players working on shows and then you end up having a boom operator go down. Who do you get to replace them in a busy time of year? That's a problem. So what some shows have done is they have kept people on reserve, on staff. They say, well, you're going to be a backup and they'll come in and test periodically. And if you're on a union show, they may be testing uh, and paying you $250 per test in order for you to be tested for COVID uh, because it, it takes out of your day and you can't book anything else on that day. And if that's the case, then you would be going in for that. Now, what some shows are doing is they're putting you on hold or keeping you on call, for example. And so that way you can't book another show. But what they'll do is they'll pay you eight hours a day for you to sit at home and st- sit there in case there is a need for you to come in and replace the person that you are backing up for. What some shows are doing is they're bringing that person in for eight hours of the day. They'll say, okay, well, you're going to be on the staff, but you're going to only come in for the second uh, for like the last, you're going to come in two hours later, or you're going to come in at the beginning of the day and you're going to go home at the last bit. Sometimes the on-call person is subject to sound mixer telling them you're, when you're going to come in. So you may say, oh, we have a big scene at the beginning of the day, come in at the beginning of the day. And then the scenes afterwards, you can leave early. Or they may say, you, uh, we're going to, it's going to take us two hours to get going in the morning. Don't bother coming in. So it is, it is being handled different way, differently by different studios, according to what I've been told and what I've heard, seen online and received in emails. And it's kind of interesting. Everybody, stu- every studio, <laughs> every studio is handling things differently. They're with the zip fizz. Cause I figured somebody was going to tell me to dis- do a zip fizz later. So I brought him in and that's what you just heard fall and hit the floor is my entire thing of zip fizz. Isn't that awesome? So let's talk a little bit more about the actual protocols and being a boom operator and trying to exist on set when there are issues with the whole six feet, 15 minutes thing. Because what I can tell you is that if you are on set in the only place that anyone has thought about putting you, You have your camera operators all spaced evenly six feet apart. Lights are all over the other place. You have no place to be, right? Except right between all of them. If you test positive, you bring down the entire cam department due to exposure. That's something I made production very aware of unless they are considering me when they set up a scene. And now I will go to the DP and say, if you jam all those cameras in there, I will have no place to be. And they'll say, I I don't know what you want from me. Just go wherever you need to. They don't care sometimes. Or they could say, oh yeah, good, good thought here. Let's not put in another camera. Depends on the DP. Depends on the show. Some people, some shows will alternate out cameras because if you have two cameras that are, let's say five feet apart, if you were in there for two takes and each one of those takes is three minutes long, by the time you get rolling and everything, that's six minutes of exposure. Go tighter. You go Two more takes. Now you're sitting at 12 minutes exposure. If you go for another take on each one of those, and it's three takes, then three takes, you now have two cameras that have been exposed to each other. In order to alleviate that, what they have done is since they have three cameras, bring in two of them here and then swap out one and bring in the other and then swap out this one and bring in those two. So that way you're alternating through the cameras and that way there's not 15 minutes of exposure between them because another thing to consider is the length of your day. If you're trying to schedule about a 10 hour day and you finish in nine, that's going to be a lot better than it's going to be if you do a 14 hour day because it's still a 24 hour exposure exposure period. And you see where I'm going with this. It could be potentially problematic if you have too much exposure to someone on the set. So there are people that will consider exposure 
to be something that is extremely important to man manage as a boom operator. And the reason why is because the last thing you want to do is step on set, be exposed to everybody and to shut down everything or to be exposed to everybody because of long takes and because of long setups. You do four or five takes of a two minute long setup and in one setup of the day, you're, expo you're almost ex completely exposed. By the time you go tighter, you're gonna be exposed to everybody. So that means if any of them test positive, you're going home and someone else is gonna have to re replace you on set. And productions that pay sick pay now, which is something that we've never seen before, will only give you 10 days of pay. So if you go home, because someone tests positive for 14 days, two weekends in that time period, you've used all your sick pay. If the show is six months long and somebody else sends you home, you still test negative, but someone else is in, uh, exposes to you later. You're going home again. This time it's without pay. You can go home an infinite number of times due to your exposure if you don't test positive. If you do test positive and you do your 14 day quarantine period, a lot of these shows will not test you again for 90 days. Now, I know what you're thinking. That seems a little bit ridiculous because there is considered to be a high amount of false positives with PCR tests even that are supposed to be 99.8% accurate. We definitely know that it has to do with the technique that they use, how they swirl it around your nostrils. If it's a deep swab, if it's a shallow swab, there's a whole bunch of different factors that go into play. But if you test positive and show no symptoms, you're back at work within 14 days and you will not be tested again on many shows for another 90 days and they do not acknowledge antibody tests to see if you did have it now that does mean that you could still be sick and if you're sick and just not testing positive because of the viral load shedding and and the schedule of your of your pcr tests and the fact that you don't take them anymore you're only going to be tested twice after you're positive you could still have it. You could technically be passing it on to other people, but not being tested because some sh some uh, some networks are not uh, uh, acknowledging a, an antibody test as being something valid because the CDC does uh, they they follow CDC guidelines and and will usually follow doctors and hospitals or something that they have connections to. These are things to be aware of. You do not want to be exposed to someone. So that does mean if they do multiple long takes and they do multiple setups, you do need to talk to someone, your union steward that's on the set if you're on a union show. If not, talk to the first AD and say, or, or your sound mixer and say, how in the world am I supposed to be personally responsible for myself and maintain a social distance when we do so many takes, when we do so many setups and we're on small sets that I cannot avoid being exposed to? What, what the first AD could say is, well, you might have to run a lob sometimes. Your sound mixer is going to say, get in there and boom the scene unless you have multiple boom operators. Even then, how often do we usually use two booms on a set? Usually pretty often. We'll do one for on camera, one for off camera, one for one person all the way on the right side of the set, one person all the way on the left side of the set. You'll trade off, you'll hand off, you'll do all kinds of things. But these are things for you to be aware of, especially if you're a boom operator, because you could potentially be exposed to quite a few people on set just by you not paying attention to it. Now, how has this affected my workflow? One of the things I have done when I've been on these shows is I have watched from the monitors. I'll peek in, I'll walk on set, I'll look at things if, and I'll look at the lighting. Sometimes what I'll end up doing is I'll go right to where the actors are standing, right where the stand-ins are, do this number, glance around just to make sure there's nothing I'm, I would notice if I were on set and then address those if I need to. Those can lights, can those go off? Cool. Thanks, DP. And then I walk away. Then I watch from the monitors. If I start to see uh, shadows starting to change uh, or during the camera movements, I start to say, wow, they're moving a lot in that room. I'm going to go in there and look to see, do you have dolly track out there? Do you have dance floor down? And I'm going to start to kind of pick and choose what I'm going to have to do. And I'll talk to the dolly groups at that point, trying to maintain a social distance because I know that as soon as they call roll, I'm going to have to step on set and I will still have to do my job and have everything worked out. That does mean if we have to put down carpets, if we have to address something, if we have to address heel caps, whatever silencing noises on set, all that kind of stuff still needs to be done while maintaining a social distance. You can't get out of that stuff just by saying, oh, well, COVID doesn't work. So what you're, what you're having to do still is your job while not being on set doing it. I usually live on set. I usually wash the lighting setup. And, and that way, if somebody is tweaking the light, I could go over and say, hey, can, we, can you throw that barn door in, you know, and keep, kick it off that back wall there? 
can you build a snood around that and ask uh, you know the the grips to go up there and bow, build a snood off of a of a can light lift they can't blow it out they say i need it to light up that wall well can you snood it off so it's not hitting the actors yeah i can do that for you thanks and thanks also for mentioning it while i'm up on the ladder sure thing i've had to address a few issues and do that on the fly so that that way people understand that I'm still on set and still talking about things. I'm still running the set, but I cannot do it while being on set because of exposure, especially on small sets. There's one set that we were shooting on that was 12 by 12. Well, in a 12 by 12 room, it doesn't give you very much of an opportunity to avoid exposure to other people, does it? There's not really a way that you can potentially avoid exposure to at least someone because you can't be on the polar opposites of the room or even on opposite sides of the wall and not be exposed to someone standing in the middle of the room. It's just not going to happen in a 12 by 12 room. So be aware of your exposure times and stuff. A lot of shows are starting to use little devices that will contact trace for them. That will, you get a little device, you put it on your name badge, you will keep it in your, uh, uh, on your person somewhere and what it will do is it will detect if it's approximately six feet away from another person and it will log that so that that way if you end up getting sick you will suddenly say you'll, you'll suddenly say um okay well i need you to turn in your little badge thing or we're going to contact trace and we're going to see exactly who you could potentially be exposed to And that's that way you could be identified as someone that's been too close to someone if you've been close to set. Now, one of the things that people are very, very bad about is knowing how far away six feet, six feet is. Many times people will stand about four, four and a half feet away from me and I'll step back a little bit more and then they'll step right back back in and I'll say, ah, oh, hold on a second now. Uh, you know, we do need to back up a little bit here. And I'll, I'll set my boom sometime to six feet and I'll show them what it is because it's different when you're standing there talking to someone because you don't see that distance unless you're a first AC who is constantly measuring distances, unless you're a boom operator with, and you say, oh, I know exactly how far away you are because if I have the boom set to a length of about six feet and I hold it over my head, I know what six feet is. You're not six feet. The device that you're wearing would contact trace you and say you're within six feet. Exposure. So be aware of this. Now, if you are on a show that just does not seem to care anything about COVID protocols, I'm going to share with you something that you do need to know. There is an app may, uh, produced by the International Cinematographers Guild, ICG 600, and I think it's called ICG Safety. I'm going to look it up and I'm going to tell you what it is right now. ICG Safety. It comes up. doesn't matter that it's for camera. You can still use it. The thing that I'm going to point out to you is the top number right there, the top little selection right there, studio safety numbers, OSHA, DGA USA, IATC, SAG-AFTRA, 20th Century Fox, ABC, Walt Disney, CBS, DreamWorks, HBO, MGM, A, uh, UA, NBC, Universal, Paramount, Prospect, Showtime, Sony, Stars, Turner, Warner Brothers, and, the, and, the, and, and you have the phone numbers for those. So if you just call, let's just pick Showtime. Showtime right there. It comes right up and you can hit the number and call them and either speak to someone or leave them a voicemail message. And that will be handled seriously from the safety team and compliant and, and, and someone will inform your show. It will be anonymous. You do not need to say anything. It's not going to be they're going to record your voicemail and hit forward on it. At least as far as I know, it's going to be listened to someone. They're going to put it into words and it's going to be sent to your production office and, and to your producers or UPM. So that way they get the message. And I have heard of people saying, you're ignoring things. You're ignoring COVID safety protocols that we're responsible for. And I can't allow that to happen if I'm being responsible for it. If you, if you say, okay, well, I mean, we just, you know, it's, it, we're not going to be able to maintain, um, you know, this, co these, this, this standard here, you know, that's fine. You're going to be exposed. Oh, well, we tried. If that's the way they're looking at it, you don't need to see it that, that way. That doesn't fly for you because you still signed a document that said you're going to take it seriously. So definitely take it seriously. Thank you, Curtis, for that comment. It's my it's the 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 nice haircut comment that comes. I tell you, I, I, I jokingly say I get fleeced once every quarter. And I mean, they basically just you know take it all down. And then when it starts going out of control again, we fleece me again. That's the joke. So my point here is. 
some shows are also looking at it as even though you are doing your job and the first AD and the production, the director who wants to constantly run takes and the, the production designer is making small sets, it still falls on you to maintain the safety guidelines and COVID protocols that they require you to sign off on on your start paperwork. Because if you don't, there is now some shows are now putting punishments on, let's say, that will that will be something that, that does affect you. You are going to potentially run into a circumstance where you are going to be written up if you cannot maintain those standards. I know. It seems very unreasonable. I've heard people tell me this. It's not happening on my show, but I've heard of it happening where someone says, yeah, because I signed the, for the, the form that says I'll adhere to the COVID protocols, I'm unable to do it. And so they just kind of shrug and say, well, geez, that sucks. I guess I can't do it for this scene. And then all of a sudden, because you were considered to be routinely when your contact trace, they say you're routinely because of the device uh, within six feet of someone for 15 or more minutes per day. You're not being responsible. You're going to be punished. I know it's not fair. I've heard of this happening, though. So. There are there are other things to be aware of also on these set on these shows. For example, you're going to be wearing a mask all day. I know what some people have said that masks are only effective. You know, there was an article that came out the week of Thanksgiving that said, uh, and I forgot who it was from. It was from some Ivy League school that's connected to a, uh, a hospital or something like that. And what it said is that they are only effective for 7.5 to 11.11% 11 11 of the time. Here, I don't know. I don't. I don't honestly care about it. What I do know is that it is part of a solution. This social distancing and the fact that everyone is using hand sanitizer and or washing their hands and there's hand washing stations around set. People are actually upping their san sanitation practices that didn't used to happen before. A combination of all of this is proving to be pretty helpful on set. So I don't know if you just wear a mask and then you are, are staying within six feet. That's still going to expose you. If you take off your mask, you could be written up for that. Uh, suspended or even terminated. If you say, I'm not going to wear a mask, screw that. If you don't wash your hands and stuff, then you're going to be passing on germs. It doesn't matter if they're yours or you're passing on exposure from someone else. You do need to take it seriously. If you're asymptomatic, you may say, look, I can't get it. Doesn't mean you can't give it to someone that you, that you live with, a loved one, your roommate, a grandparent. Doesn't mean that you're not going to pass it on to someone that's on the set that you care about. One of your friends, your sound mixer that you work with a lot, sound mixer goes uh, goes down and has to drop out of a show and you're a boom operator. They may say, well, we have to replace the sound mixer for a period of time. Okay, well, who's that going to be? Could be another sound mixer who says, I've got to I got to bring in my boom operator. You say, well, you're just coming in to actually fill in for the sound mixer until they relieve. I'm not going to do that. Not unless I can bring in my team. Who knows? Could happen. But what I'm telling you right now, just for you to be aware of, is that there are COVID protocols. I strongly suggest you read whatever they are on the show that you're going to be on because there are constant changes. Now, one thing I will say about masks, personally, as a sound person, I hate this design of mask, the one that goes over your ears. I always do this and then pull it down. That way it's in the right place. Drives me crazy, this thing, over my ears because then you wear headphones and it sandwiches in there and this little bead in the back gets pr it pressed into my head with my nose all day. So this kind of mask, I hate. So what I did is I contacted Made in USA Notice. This is the Los Angeles Apparel Company, I believe it is. If you're watching the replay of this later, I will have links down in the description for it. But what this is, is it's a very thin mask, even though they want you to wear a thicker one. Uh, this wraps around your head. And then you put it up there. I do the same thing. I put it on. And then you snug it into your nose, however, however you want it to be. The downfall with this very thin mask is it kind of feels like a washcloth on the inside. If you have a little bit of scrufflies on your nose or you have uh, on, your, on your beard or something like that, you can feel it, you know, scratch your, you know, you can feel it, you know, scratch your face. It feels kind of like a washcloth, not like a microfiber cloth because that would be really bad. But you notice, watch this, watch this as I breathe in and out. <sighs> See how it kind of goes in and out more so than another mask. If I put this mask on, for example, it's not going to go in and out. It's a little bit thicker. So this holds its shape. Even when you look at it from the side, it doesn't move in and out. 
The other mask definitely does. See the thickness on this thing right there versus the thickness of this? It's quite a bit thinner, right? So if I put this mask on, ah, oh, that elastic just snapped in my face. That's brilliant. Okay, so this is the mask that I usually wear on set all day long. I will wear these routinely. There's like, they're $5 a piece or something like that, but it goes around my head and I can easily put it up here and then around my neck. And it's not going to bother me. Not like wearing something that goes over your ears. Now, I know Ursa makes the masky. I know there's other companies on Amazon that make little things but th uh, that, that go over your ears. But here's the problem with those. And I did experiment with them before Ursa even came out with the masky. Here's the issue that I run into. Even if you wear a mask that is overly big, you start to wear those devices and it pulls off of your ears a little bit. Or does it? Because it's still putting pressure on my ears. Now, it takes that little bead thing off of my ear but it's still highly annoying because now it's going to pull flat against my face see this ah it's going to hurt over over the course of time so even if you get a looser one or double them up it's still going to be kind of annoying isn't it i much prefer to wear this kind of mask that goes around my head now what that does also mean is that if I am required by my show to wear a face shield also, it is low enough profile that uh, I'm going to have to be aware of this if I put on a face shield. Um, it's low profile enough that it's not going to be sticking out from my face overly much. The biggest thing I've run into that's a, an issue with the face shields, if they give you one of those that says face shield across the front, it doesn't vent properly. It's a little elastic strip that goes around there. I know there's a kind that also goes on like glasses and it's a, and, and it's a shell that stays away from your face. If you go down and it can hit your your chest a little bit. The biggest issue I've run into with face shields is you got to be careful in, with one that doesn't stick out too far. Because if it sticks out too far, boom, boom, boom. It's going to hit your shoulders as you're booming. If you have your arms over your head, if you're doing this kind of thing, even then it can hit your shoulders a bit. So you have to be very careful with how you are wearing these devices and how you're wearing them on your head. Especially when you start doubling up on multiple materials. Face shield and a mask at the same time can easily start to be overwhelming and drive you cr crazy. If that's what your show requires you to do, you got to do it. Now, what I ended up buying, and I'll put a link down to this in, in the description also if you're watching the replay. What I ended up buying is another device, uh, a different kind of face shield that has, um, because venting is, a, is an issue that I, that I have, I don't like fogging up. M many of these masks that will blow, they, that blow out hot air all throughout them they'll start to fog up even if and if it doesn't vent out the top like the ones that say face shield that's like a, a sponge that goes over here with the shield on that those don't vent at all those things will actually start streaming on the inside because it fills up it fogs originally and you can't see through it then it fogs up more and more and more until it starts streaking and streaming uh down the, down the inside of the thing those things annoy me very badly so if you can get the kind of mask that goes as a as glasses over your ears then you end up having your headphones that press in on those just like they do glasses. The kind of face shield I have, and I'll put, like I said, I'll put a link down to this in, in the description. It is an anti-fog, anti-scratch mask, and it fits over my head in such a way where if I position my headphones, if I put the, the head thing on and lift it up, I can kind of fit my headphones on my, my MDR 7506s, and then I can bring the face shield down, and it barely pushes the headphones back ever so slightly. But if I, if I position it just right, then it's going to be a little bit better. Now, still, I do have the same issue when I turn my head. It still hits my shoulder a little bit. It's going to be a reality of a face shield because they usually stick down farther than your chin. Now, there is one that's a very low profile version I've seen on Amazon that goes glasses and it kind of goes down and it makes like a little almost a cardioid type shape down below your mouth. And it's a very low profile. I don't know how effective those are. There's a lot of description uh, in the description. People that ordered them before about October, they say, oh, these are the best things ever. But after October, they started sending out a piece of garbage that's nothing like the pictures. So if you look at those, then you'll, you'll see that there's a potential, a, a potential issue with the, the face shields. So be aware of what you're buying and how you're buying it. But let's, let's, let's jump off of the whole COVID thing. That's at least um, something I wanted you to be aware of when you're on set. Now let's talk about changes to me and my workflow. I ended up having that chest rig that you've seen, the, what is it called? Covert escapes 
uh, chess rig. That thing ended up being, it was nice in many ways. It was also, it stuck out a bunch. It was low profile, small. It had a place for you to put a, a, a mag light on the outside of it. And, but it stuck out quite a bit. What I wanted to get is something that was low profile. And I actually had the, the cross design in the back. There was a, a little stud that, that, that put the two straps and held them together. That ended up breaking off. So what I ended up doing is looking online and I found a different type of, of chess rig. I'll put the link down in the description. But what that does is it's a lower profile. It's a bigger thing, first of all, with three different pouches. And it also has a zipper on the front while I keep my wallet and my keys in. And so that way they're always on me. And if I end up take, taking the chess rig off, I'll end up taking the keys and the, and the um, wallet out and putting those in my pocket. So that way they're always on me. I never... I don't ever put my wallet inside the trailer or put my keys inside the trailer. I don't ever do that. I always keep them on me and I never take them off. If I ever take them off, uh, I take them out of the chest rig. I will always put them into my pockets. That way I don't leave set and then get my, uh, get up to my car and say, where are my keys? Why is my car not letting me? Oh, geez, I don't have my keys on me. And there goes the trailer driving down the road. I don't want that to happen. So I always keep them on me. Now, this is a bit wider, but it fits across the chest better and it's lower profile. So it only sticks out about that much. I like that personally, then it's sticking out about that much like the covert escape chest rig does. So that's one change that I have. It also has Velcro on the front and Velcro in the back. So be aware, people could end up putting Velcro messages on the back of your the, the chest rig if they want to be funny. But it also fits better. It's smaller, smoother to the back. So even though this thing is only $15, which is about half the price as the covert escape one, I find it to be made better in many ways than the covert escape one. And I prefer it and I'm using that. That's why I'm recommending it. So that's that's that. Um, one thing I'm a big advocate for also is vitamins, not just because of COVID. I took vitamins long before that, but definitely because of it. I find that using vitamins and taking vitamins is extremely critical because it's going to keep you healthy, especially as the temperatures change. I used to have big sinus issues. Anytime the seasons would change, I would start to have sniffles and stuff. My mom would instantly take me to the doctor, get me on antibiotics that ended up being the most terrible thing in the world that you could do for someone's immune system, because it means that first of all, the, you know, antibodies, uh, the, the antibiotics only work effectively for a certain amount of time. And then after a while, they completely stop working on you and you don't want to use them completely out of your system and have them not be effective anymore while you're still young. And unfortunately that was the case with me. Uh, they, they were, I was on antibiotics a lot as a kid. And when I first got married, my wife was like, you get sniffles and your nose starts running, you you go to the doctor instantly to get things fixed. No, you got to get your immune system going again. So that's one of the things that was pretty rough for the first couple of years. It's like, nope, you're not going to be on antibiotics for that. That's just a nasal, that's just a, a, a sniffles. That's just a cold. And I was, I was bad. There was a couple of times I ended up having a upper respiratory infector, infection and I had to get up, given breathing treatments in a, in a, in a doctor's office using a nebulizer because my lungs were in that bad of shape. Now it could have also been that I was a martial arts instructor for a while. And we went through this one summer, we were doing um, cleaning of the, the, the tile floor using a combination that the masters thought was a brilliant one because it worked really well. And that was using a mur muriatic acid, which is 31.45% uh, hydrochloric acid. Believe me, I remember that because it was extremely hard to breathe in that room. We had to set up a draw, a draw where we draw, draw air in through with these big, huge fans in the back to the front. And that way, hopefully it would draw it away from us, but still, it still tore you up to give you an idea. When you pour it, when you put it on the ground and you used a mop on that, the mop would usually only last about two or so hours before it ate through the mop and the mat, we had to trade off and get another mop. That's what I was breathing. Isn't that wonderful? So we ended up having uh, the combination between the nasal stuff, taking too many antibiotics and not allowing my immune system to actually heal up. While I was trying to recover my immune system, I had this wonderful fun of inhaling a bunch of muriatic acid. And because about a, a year before I was a martial arts instructor and got on that process, uh, I used to work in a call center at Earthlink. And when I did that, I was told a great thing to do for your voice is to take a shot of, of apple cider vinegar every day. Well, what people would tell you to do is take that shot, throw it in a bottle of water. That way it's something that you can swallow uh, and, and it, makes it, it makes it less abrasive and less harsh on you. The problem is who wants to drink at the time it was like a 20 fluid ounce bottle. Who wants to drink a 20 fluid ounce bottle full of apple cider vinegar when it's, it tastes that way? 
I didn't want to. So what I would do is I'd take literally a shot of it in a little bitty bit of a cup. I drink it straight, which was terrible for my throat lining because it is indeed an acid. So then I went from having no immune, a, a very weak immune system, taking that through, throwing off my entire throat lining and then inhaling uh, a bunch of hydrochloric acid. You can see where I'm going with this. It messed me up for a while, <laughs> but I'll tell you this. I did recover and I'm a lot better now because I'm taking a lot of vitamins and not doing so much stupid stuff. Now it could be debatable because I am male and I'm still very goofy that I still do a lot of stupid stuff. But I'll tell you this, I'm not inhaling muriatic acid in, in that kind of a, an environment uh, anymore. 31.45% hydrochloric acid. I'm not taking sh straight shots of uh, apple cider vinegar anymore. And I am not uh, uh, doing, a, you know, uh, taking antibiotics and not allowing my immune system to fix itself. So what vitamins do I take? I'm going to talk about this because people have asked me this before in emails, and I'm going to go ahead and just do this once and for all. That way, you know what I take every single day. I start off and you have to have your multivitamin. Okay. So just a regular multivitamin that you end up taking. And this is just a complete, this is for adults. You can, it, you can take the ones that are over, over 40, over 50, whatever. And you know, it has a pretty decent mixture of everything on the back. Vitamin A, 117%. It's a little bit lacking on vitamin C. It's uh 67%. Now different combinations are, are, are effective to a certain degree. Um, I also take vitamin C with zinc and this has 227% of zinc. Now, one of the reasons I'm a big uh, advocate for the zinc as well, uh, and I even take a separate zinc su supplement, not just because of the, um, uh, the COVID stuff, but it actually is good for your immune system. Now, you should also take a vitamin D3 with at least 100% or with, with vitamin K built into it. Vitamin D3 is going to be uh, helpful too because it's like, you know, what, sun, what the sun does for you with vitamin D. Uh, I also take, <laughs> this is one of the funny things, because I'm constantly learning scripts and stuff like that, I want to make sure that as I get older, my mind doesn't start to fail me, so I use ginkgo biloba. And what's funny is I'll forget to reorder it or I'll forget that I'm out of it, or I'll forget something. And so I'm like, I'll jokingly say, you know, this stuff doesn't work that well because I'm constantly forgetting it. What's it called? Ginseng. Wait a minute, ginseng, that's not it. It's ginkgo biloba, that's what it is. Look, I'm over 40, and supposedly when you're over 40, your brain starts to get a little bit uh, mush. Anyway, glucosamine chondritin MSM. Uh, I take the kind by Puritan's Pride that is only a two per day. They do make a three per day. Make sure you see the number two on there or the number three on there if you want to. The reason I like this is because 360 capsules, you can get 180 days out of it versus 120 days out of it if it says a three on there. And it's just a little bit stronger. And that's what I take, basically. The combination of, of using this, you see what it says there? Joint soother. If you're a boom operator, I think that it's a good idea for you to take something like that just because it helps your joints and to keep things moving. So believe it or not, I take all of these at night, right before I go to bed. You may say, that's a little bit overkill. Yes, it is. I don't need to take any of these. I used to just take this. But I decided that your body gets rid of excess vitamins and you just urinate them out. So, oops, wait a minute. What is this one? Did I forget another one? Oh yeah, turmeric. Wouldn't you know, I forgot one. So I also take a turmeric uh, because I find that that's, that's also good. Um, I remember my wife told me to take this. What does this thing do? Uh, <laughs> I did remember at one point in time, but I forgot now. Um, I don't know. I don't remember what it does. Wife told me it was a good thing to take and I believe her and I, and, and I listen to her whenever I remember to. So anyway, those are the vitamins I take. That is, that's said everything that I potentially take with exception of zip fizz. I take one zip fizz a day, whether I need to or not for health reasons. I personally love my zip fizz. I love the, the flavor. I love the taste of it. It just to me is a wonderful thing. And it has a lot of vitamins in it. I dropped a whole thing of zip fizz on the floor at the beginning of the stream. And this thing has a bunch of vitamins in there too. It's got uh, 833 percent vitamin C in the day uh, that you need for the day. Uh, vitamin E is 50 percent. Vitamin 
what is it, thiamine, 50%, riboflavin, 50%, niacin, 50%, vitamin B6, 50%. Now, here's the big one. Vitamin B12, 2,500 milligrams, which is 41,667% of your daily requirements. Anti-inflammatory, turmeric, thank you. So that's a lot of B12. Now, I'll tell you this also. I don't usually drink caffeine. I don't need it. And because I don't need it, this here, you would imagine that it just, if I don't have it, a crash. If it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do that to you, does the blah, blah, blah. it doesn't help my speech, but it doesn't do that to you. So you can take a zip fizz if you want, and you don't have a sugar crash. You don't have a caffeine crash that happens when a lot of people take carbon, uh, drink a lot of carbonated drinks. If they drink coffee in excess, you don't have that with zip fizz. You get a boost and then you instantly, when it runs out, um, it's, it's just, it's out. You, they say, don't take more than like three a day. Personally, I just take one and I take it mainly because I love the flavor of it and it's great for also hydration. If you're in the middle of the summer and the temperatures are 100 degrees outside, you're supposed to drink three bottles of water and then have one uh, Powerade, a Gatorade, something along those lines, or a Zip Fizz in water, an emergency, something along those lines. The pills, even if you're dietary restrictions, the, there are pills that replenish electrolytes. So um, you can take those as well. And, and uh, that will help with hydration. But Ziphiz also replaces the antioxidants and it helps with hydration. It even says that on there and it has zero sugar. So that's always great too. Uh, so that is a little bit more about the vitamins that I take. Now, people have been asking me also, how bad was it when I went back to set and started booming again after not booming for seven months? And that's just full time. The last show I did do, I just filled in for two days for somebody and then they did the shutdown. I only had four days of work before COVID shut, shut us down on um, in the middle of May, on, in the middle of March, rather, 2020. Um, my, the show I was on finished the second week of January. And so for two months, I only worked like four days. And I was down. I had three shows lined up and all of them canceled when COVID hit. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, that was that was something to me that uh, that that people have been asked a lot is how bad was it when I first stepped back on set and I started booming again? Well, I'll tell you this: it's very easy for you to look at th this and say it's going to be like redoing, uh, relearning how to do everything again. You got to do your exercises. You got to do, you know, your stretches. You got to keep your cardio up. You got to keep everything. Now that's that's good for health purposes, but what's it like when you're a boom operator? You step back on set. Do you have to practice? Not if you use proper boom technique. If you have not watched it, Ken Strain has uh, on videomantis.com, he has a three hour boom seminar. And in that, he talks about some of the techniques and how you do it. I've talked about it on this channel. I've talked about it in live streams. I definitely have taught it in, in the live person classes that I've done. But the main gist of it is if you hold your arms over your head needlessly, there is no reason to do that. People always say, oh, boom operator, that's the guy that holds the boom over their head. Not always. If you do that, sure, it's going to put pressure on your rotator cuff. It's going to constantly strain your muscles. It's going to constantly make you tired. It's going to mean that you're just going to be sore. I've been back on set for two months now. I have not once been driving home with sore muscles because I've been on set booming. Now, there is no question about it. I could be in a lot better shape. As a matter of fact, 2021, actually 2017 was a big year for me because I decided I was going to go on this extreme diet that I invented, which was basically allow myself no more than three carbs per week. And then I called it the 100 diet where I had 75 desserts that I allowed myself throughout the year, 20 hours that were free hours for me to eat whatever I wanted to include, including carbs, and then five free days. And if I went above those 100 then uh, I was going to, I was going to um, uh, basically, uh, I was going to donate the other people that were in, in there. There was one other guy I said uh, that we were in a competition with each other. I said that if I, if I lose, then I will donate a hundred dollars to your charity of your choice and choice. And likewise, well, I made it until uh, October, but the, the, the powers of, of the pumpkin in a ha living in a house full of females where they were constantly saying, we need Cheesecake Factory. Now we need pumpkin pie. Now we need this. And they're like, you should have some with this, dad. I'm like, 
okay. Wife says, it's my birthday. I want to have something. I say, okay, fine. When it was my birthday, you got to have a birthday cake. Fine. I'll have some of that too. And my dessert started to go away real quickly. Unfortunately, all my free days went away because I went on a cruise that year uh, to Alaska and all of my free days were wiped out as long, along with a lot, a lot of my free hours. But regardless, that was something that uh, I did in 2017, 2021. I'm going to be doing something not nearly as drastic. I'm going to be involving the exercise bike that I have over there. I'm going to be doing a lot more push-ups and, and stuff like that. Just w when I used to do it, um, I worked with a sound mixer in the past that, that said to me, we're going to, it was every hour throughout the day, we would drop down and do a, a minimum of 10 push-ups. First couple of days, it tore, it was so tiring. After a while, your body develops a, a tone to it. And then we started adding, you know, 10 seconds, you know, uh, 10 seconds of planking, then 10 more push-ups, then 10 more seconds of planking. We started doing that every hour. And it was extremely, it was extremely helpful to building upper, upper body strength that you didn't even know you had. So I'm going to probably go back to doing something like that and doing no less than like 50 push-ups a day. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be eating better, smaller portions, a uh, lot less sugar and stuff like that, which my wife and daughters always say it makes me, it puts me in great moods. But then back in 2017, I'm, I, I was a little bit more aggressive about it than I'm going to be next year. So I'm expecting to lose weight uh, and, and to be healthier because during the whole quarantine thing, man, I got out of control just from eating whatever was around the house and stuff. I want to get back into eating better. That's something I do miss. So that's something coming up in 2021. If you look at the videos at the beginning of this channel, that was in 2017. You'll see that I was like very, very, uh, uh, very toned in my face. Uh, I, I look like a different person. One of the comments that somebody made this last week is, dude, you need to get your thyroid checked. I'm like, no, thyroid's just fine. It's just lazy eating. It's being irresponsible is what it is. And that's, that was me. Um, okay. So enough about that. Proper boom techniques is important, but so is having shoe insoles. Now, if you watch my my top 10 videos with Ken Strain, I do talk about shoe insoles, and it's very important for you to get shoe insoles that work well for your feet. So you might need to get a custom one made. You might end up trying one of the Dr. Scholl's machines at Walmart and seeing if it's going to work for you. You can try it if you want to. The big thing is you want to get something that works well for you and with you. That's the big kicker. So... If you find yourself, if you find yourself wanting to wear a, a certain type of shoe because of the way it feels and because of how quiet it is, because of it, it's, it's got a good grip on it, something like that. And you're like, but it's just not comfortable. Get yourself an insole and that's going to be, that's going to help you out quite a bit. It's something that many shoes, you can just rip it right out of the shoe and then add your own insole. Personally, the ones I get are the full length insoles that are on the inside. Uh, I tried the little wedge on your, on your heel, but that thing, it started sliding on the inside. I didn't like it when I tried sticking it down, it folded up in weird places and it made my foot lopsided. I hated it. I yanked the things out, put the other insole back in there. and was just uncomfortable until it was time for me to get another shoe. Now I use the regular type of, of insoles and it works just, just fine. But when you are on set for 12, 14 hours a day, you want to have good insoles. If you stand on them constantly. There was a, a retired veteran uh, of 30 plus years who did one little post one day. He decided he was going to do one post at the very end of his career. And he said, what have I learned from my 30 plus years on set? Sit down whenever you can. Well, I don't have to actually live it and, 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 and feel like I'm invincible and stuff like that when I'm younger and say, yeah, man, I, I could just stand up for hours and stuff. I'm going to listen to my elders. I'm going to listen to people that have actually gone through this and had have aged and that know what's up, the, uh, up ahead, and that, you know, say things like that word of wisdom, that th those words of wisdom. I'm going to listen to them. And so I have that little collapsible stool that if you saw the Sound Speeds podcast, I talk about the collapsible stool, and I think that it's great. It, it can support up to 320 pounds. It collapses down to like two, two inches. I'm not, you know, near 320 pounds, so it's no problem for me. I can sit on that thing. The one thing I would say is just do not sit on an angle on that thing. If there's a hill, don't put it down there and then sit on that because what happens is it puts pressure on the wrong places. There was a, There's a, a guy that's probably 150 pounds wet, and he sat down on it and on an angle, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the take, slam, big loud slam noise. We were all concerned, and then it just we found out it was one of those, those collapsible stools collapsing. 
and it completely shattered apart. So uh, Eldis says he tried the Walmart uh, machine and it works great for him. That's fine. Uh, I know he's on his feet a lot for his job. So that's pretty much the content I have for this uh, stream. I do have two more things I want to mention. If you are not aware of it, I do have memberships on this channel and I've had them now for about a month, month and a half, something like that. What that does is that means that there are three different levels for you to join at. Eldest, who's in here right now, and you can see him in the chat. Eldest is a member. Uh, there's a five mem uh, five dollar roughly. There's a ten dollar roughly, and a twenty five dollar uh, monthly. Um, and there are advantages to each one of those. The five dollar one, I I interact. I do posts that are only for them. I sent out pictures of me pretty annoyed, you know, on Friday because I got rained on and I got really mad. And so I'm I'm. You can see rain all around me. I'm inside of a tent. I was drenched. I posted that picture for them to for them to see. At the ten dollar mark or more, I'll usually do. Uh, there's I, I've done it like once per week, but I'll probably do it at least at least two or three times per month. And what that is is I, I'll do like an outtake from the episode that I shoot or something from set of me just doing something. I have I have one scheduled to go out in a couple of days. Um, and there's and that's and that's good times. Uh, and then at the twenty five dollar level, I actually know the guy, and so. You know, I said, I actually, you know, he has my contact information. So I said, hey, you go. If you ever have a, a question or need help with something like that, here's my number because I know him. And uh, if you join and I don't know you, I'd probably start off for at least the first couple of months and say, let's do a Skype call if you need if you need help on something like that. But I offer and what I actually do promise as part of that membership level is uh, support, you know, via email. But I'll probably be more generous about it because, you know, geez, if you're going to support me at twenty five dollars per month or more then I definitely think that uh, you should you should get something for that in addition to the 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 pictures and stuff like I share I share plant microphone stuff I share uh you know outtakes and stuff like that with with all these different the different people but there's a, a different level of content that I create uh for those people um so memberships are available you see the join button down below this uh this if you are interested uh that's that the last thing I'll tell you is that it is very important, especially in the winter months, especially with something like COVID going around, which by in America, we have never seen cold months with COVID. Because if you remember, as soon as COVID just came to America, as soon as it hit, what happened? Instantly, it got hot. And people were like, well, it could dissipate with the heat. you know. It, and we know it didn't. It, it was still all summer. It got worse. But what I will tell you is that now we're moving into the winter months, the colder months. You do not want to test it. If you had COVID at one point and now you are uh, and you're like, well, I'm over it now. You could have a resurgence. My wife ended up about three months after she got COVID. About three months later, she ended up getting pneumonia and it just came out of the blue. She just started having some similar symptoms again. And we're like, oh, what's this about? Went to the doctor, got to talk to the doctor. Oh, look at this. It's actually this time. It is actually uh, pneumonia. It's just pneumonia. Well, imagine living in a time where you say, oh, it was just pneumonia, but that's the time we were living in right now. And uh, eight days later, antibiotics had kicked it and she was, you know, she never really stopped. She's, she's tough cookie. So she never really stopped. But regardless, that's something for you to be aware of that in the winter months, you definitely do not want to get a cold or something, especially if you could have been exposed to it because it could resurge and it could end up causing pneumonia or something else that wipes you out and makes it very, very bad and painful for you. So I would strongly recommend that you get a very good quality jacket if you do not have one. Now, I just recently bought a J133 Carthart, uh, Carhartt, Carthart, whatever it is. It's an American brand. But I bought one of their jackets and it's canvas. So it took a little while for it to, to loosen up a little bit. It was a little bit on the stiff side. It is sized correctly for an American. So if you buy a, a medium, a large, extra large, 2XL, small, whatever size you buy, it's going to be sized correctly, if not slightly on the, on the big side. But that's going to be fine if you wear a hoodie or something underneath it. And that jacket, I'll tell you this, I wore a short sleeve shirt with that jacket over top of it down in 40 degree weather and only started to get just a wee bit chilly by the end of the 12 hour night. Maybe it was 13, <clears throat> but I will tell you this at that point, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of dew in the air. And so I was feeling a little bit of it, but I will tell you this right now, a great website to go to that. I went to be, get mine is having wonderful deals right now. It's uh, the same company that is moose jaw, but it is called Mountain Steels. It is M O U N T I I N S T E A L S dot com. Mountain Steels by Moose Jaw. They will offer better discounts than you would run into through other companies. 
It is also an American company. If you're in America and you're interested, they offer great discounts on, on great brands. And I've been buying a lot of American stuff, as you guys know. And so if you need a new jacket, strongly recommend doing that. Um, as of the time of this video, holiday 10 is a coupon code you can get to give you 10% off more on anything in addition to their lower prices. So some of them, some of their, their jackets and stuff are on sale for up to 80% off for the holidays right now. And then you can take an additional 10% off of that, which is completely insane. Now there's not very many things that are that high of a discount, but there is some. So there you go. That is everything I wanted to cover from multiple different episodes, but that's the, that is this year in recap and the information that I have to share with you. Now, I know I've been ignoring chat for this entire video, but now if you have any questions, I will be glad to take them. And in the meantime, while I'm waiting for questions to potentially come in, I'm going to pick up the zip fizz that I knocked on the ground here. So if you were watching my live streams this last summer, then you know that uh, I was trying different flavors of zip fizz. Well, somebody was nice enough to tell me that they wanted me to take different colors, uh, give different flavors of zip fizz during the live streams. And they wanted me to try them all. And I was, I was interested in trying them all. And then someone said, here, I'm going to donate this so that way you can get them all. I said, oh, that's so awesome. Thank you. So now I'm going to be able to try them all. And I'm going to ask you if you want to see, uh, see what my thoughts are on a certain flavor of Zip Fizz. We have Fruit Punch. We have Iced Tea. I've had that one. It's not good. You want to see me pucker a gag or something. That's the one to get. Pink Grapefruit. Citrus. Black Cherry. Peach Mango. Orange Cream. Blueberry raspberry, is that what that is? I guess so. Berry, lemon, orange, and pink lemonade. If there is a particular flavor that you would like to see me take of that Zip Fizz right now, I will gladly do it. And also, sorry, I've been talking nonstop for an hour. Throat is dry. Take those masks away. I don't need them anymore. Black cherry is pretty good. All right. Anybody else want to second it, uh, or debate eldest over the uh, flavor of Zip Fizz I should have right now? Since I'm now being more casual about this whole thing. Or should I go for this? I will go ahead and do the black cherry. Eldest is a member. I'm going to listen to him. Last time, I think he made the suggestion very early of what flavor he wanted me to have. and <laughs> And I didn't take it. Because I ended up having other people in there that, that wanted the same color. And he's like, but that's such a basic one. I think, what what flavor was that? Was that an orange? No, it was grape, wasn't it? Grape was the one that was missing out of there. So, here's the black cherry. As you know, you would normally put it in some sort of liquid. Now, I've been talking nonstop for a good hour. My throat is nice and, and dry. I just had a little bit of water here. Let's go for it and see how bad this is going to be. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> man, that stuff expands. Good times, man. Love Zip Fizz. So that was that. The funny thing is um, about the film industry. When the first shutdowns happened in March, the film industry in California was not considered to be an essential business. But when you have everyone sitting around at their house, binge watching everything, guess what? It became an essential business, which you heard me in live streams jokingly say back in like March and April. I'm like, we're not an essential business when everyone is sitting at home, either doing one of two things, gaming or watching TV. And if you're watching TV, fight me on this if you tell me that this is not an essential business. Television is definitely an essential business if that's all you're doing all day long is binge watching TV. Alex Azar said today that both parties wearing masks cuts transmission by 74%, and that's fine. 
I mean, like I said, I don't know what it is. I just remember seeing something the week of Thanksgiving that said seven and a half to 11% is what it actually is. And it's like shooting. And, and the analogy he said is this is like shooting a garden hose with a spray attachment on it at a, at a chain link fence. It's going to stop some, it's not going to stop at all. But the big thing is in combination with everything else, you know, with the social distancing and with the un- increased sanitation and stuff like that, it does help. So I don't mind wearing a mask. I'm just, you know, I don't want to wear one that's going to gag me when I do a walk and talk. And I'll be like, oh, I'm dying here. And I'm not going to be that, that guy. Uh, I'm going to wear one that's going to allow me to breathe through it. And it's going to be great. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Sounds Bees. Be sure to tune in the future for more. Who knows? Maybe live streams, more whatever. But whatever there will be, it will be sound advice. Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.